Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to Edinburgh today. My flight was cancelled, but I'm here in my hotel room, all dressed up so that I can give the speech to you. The topic of my speech will be bringing the joy back into medical studies. Doctors, they don't just care for patient symptoms. They provide comfort and reassurance. Patients, they want smart, competent doctors, but they also want happy doctors. So why then are medical students and doctors significantly more depressed than the population average? Let's examine this problem and look at some of the causes. Then let's talk about how we can fix this problem by bringing joy back into medical studies. My name is Kohei Yamada. I'm a recent graduate from Charles University, First Faculty of Medicine in Prague. I recently completed my PLAB examinations and I have done all the steps of the USMLE. So let's examine the problem. A systematic review and meta-analysis, which was published on PubMed, uh, pulled together 31 cross-sectional studies as well as 23 cohorts. And these studies were from the years 1963 to 2015. And then they have found that about 30% of medical students and doctors experience depression or depressive symptoms. And beyond the effect of depression on individuals, depression was linked to poor quality of patient health care as well as increased mental errors. Patients, they want happy doctors. And as human beings, doctors are also entitled to being happy. So why does medical students and doctors, why are they more like miserable than the general population? Many factors can contribute to this. And it's important to know that no two cases are the same. But there are common causes. And this affects students and doctors all the way from the United States to here in Manchester to over there in Edinburgh. Today, we will look at two of them. The first factor, medical school. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in this room, sorry, I mean your room, that medical school was tough. There was an expression, drinking water from a fire hose. The sheer amount of information that we needed to learn in such a short period of time was astounding. I remember one of my first anatomy classes that I attended. They taught us about the humorous. I was like, I can do that. It's just one name. It's just the humorous. And then came more and more names. Suddenly there were like 15, 20 names or however many names there was on the humorous. And when it came to the pelvis, forget it. Now, when you combine that immense amount of knowledge that you needed to learn in such a short period of time with like pressures of exams and the intense competition, an environment is created that advocates like Pamela Weeble describes as a military boot camp. The fact that medical students are on the whole smarter than the general population actually makes the problem worse. Studying medicine requires discipline, some intelligence, but most of all determination. And I'm sure everyone in your room have these three qualities. That is why you can progress so far in your careers or in your studies for you to reach this point. A medical school brings the smartest people from all over the country and all over the world into one institution. And suddenly, when they were the best, they may no longer be the best in the class. All the best and brightest are now competing. No wonder the pressure is immense. I remember in my university, the best students from Malaysia were selected and only the top of them were give, was awarded the medical scholarship. And with this scholarship, they were able to come to my university and study with us. However, I saw one of them fail an exam <clears throat> and he did not know how to handle the stress of failure. This led him to show some depressive symptoms, which only grew because he did not know how to speak out. He did not know how to ask for help. And eventually it got so worse, he stopped eating. He couldn't sleep properly. He just dropped out. Now this 
teaches me something or this taught me something. Of course, I tried to help, but there was nothing I could do at that moment. But it taught me that it was important to develop the skills to handle the stress of medical school. And it's important to develop a mentality to handle, this, uh, to handle the stress. And what helped me was to always keep in mind that there are two types of stresses. There is a new stress and then there is a distress. Now, new stress is the good kind of stress. It's, a stress. it's this type of stress that pushes us, that pushes us to do better, to work harder, perhaps for our family, for our friends. Whereas being distressed is being so stressed to the point that you won't be able to function. I remember in one of my exams, I was so distressed because I was so worried for that exam. I think it was pediatrics because it was one of my weaker subjects. Um, a doctor asked me a question during the exam. I completely blanked out. But after the exam, it just came back. So that is what being distressed is like. The good news is that after you finish first year of medical school, things get easier. This is because you learn the skills to cope with the stress of medical school. Uh, of medical school. For example, you learn how to study more efficiently, more practically, so that you waste less time. Even if you fail an exam, you understand, you understand why you failed it. Perhaps you did something wrong. You fix that, and then you pass it the next time. So everything that you experience in the first years of medical school, that all those lessons combined make the subsequent years easier. The bad news is that after you finish medical school and before you become a real doctor, uh, so this is the residency or the foundation years, uh, it is kind of like medical school, but on steroids. And it is much more stressful uh, it is much more competitive and it has two additional complications. The first one is we may need to move to a place that we don't want to go to. It depends on where we're matched or where we're placed. And this means we lose our support structure. We lose our home. We lose things like uh, our family and friends and perhaps our loved ones. I have moved around quite a, long, uh, quite a lot in my life and I have to say it never gets easier but you learn to cope with it. The second thing is that during your residency or foundation years, you start to make real life decisions that impact real people and have real consequences. Take for example, a farmer. He cuts his leg. Uh, he develops cellulitis. The cellulitis develops into sepsis and then he goes into shock. Now, how do we treat septic shock? We give them some fluids give them some vasopressors. But what is one of the complication of vasopressors? Acrocyanosis. Now imagine amputating his hands or his feet. How will he provide for his uh, how will he provide for the livelihood for his family? How will he feed them? And these are the things that we will surely have to face in the future. And of course once the residency or the foundation years have finished, the real world is just waiting. Thing is, they don't pay foundation doctors very well. And we have a lot of debt from medical school. So try not to look at your bank account. Now, when you put all of this together, is it really surprising that medical students and doctors are depressed? Elizabeth Poorman, a primary care doctor, she said in an interview, fundamentally, medical school and residency cause mental health disorders. They can cause depression. Given how prevalent this problem is, why don't more students and doctors seek help? Which brings us to the second point, the perceived stigma of reaching out. Now you think that people who are doctors or people that who want to be doctors or medicals or, or medical school students, they will find it easier to reach out for help, right? Why? Because they know who to talk to. They're surrounded by people that can help them. Um, they're part of the medical profession. 
and they have access to all the support. On the other hand, it's the very factors that make medical school so traumatizing that prevents students and doctors from reaching out. This is the competitiveness. This is because they tend to be terrified that if they were caught reaching out, they may be perceived as weak. And if they are perceived as weak, people lose trust in them. And this may jeopardize their, their future careers. <clears throat> On the other hand, Nathaniel P. Morris, who was a former Harvard Medical School student, he wrote, Last spring, I wrote publicly about my own struggles with depression during medical school. The days leading up to the, to the article's publication were terrifying. I, will, I, will, I worried I might lose the residency slot I had matched into or forfeit the trust of my future colleagues. Again and again, I checked the medical licensing requirements in California to make sure I wouldn't lose the ability to care for my patients. Yet my fears have gone unfounded. And in the days that followed, I received nothing but support from my colleagues and mentors. Fortunately, others are speaking up as well. There are two lessons that we can learn from Nathaniel. The first one is that we as a community, we need to be more open. We need to encourage conversation without being afraid of judgment and without being afraid of what other people may say. The second lesson is that we as individuals need to take people like Nathaniel Morris as an example and share our experiences. Whenever we're in trouble, if we share them, help will come. The consequences of not speaking out is much more than the consequences of speaking out. And what do patients want more than anything else? They want to feel a connection. When they are in illness, the only thing that could comfort them is not only their family, but perhaps what we can do for them. They don't want stressed, depressed, and anxious doctors, but they want competent and happy doctors that they can rely on. After all, as the WHO states, health is not just merely the absence of a disease, but it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Now, <clears throat> changing the paradigm. The world needs more doctors. An aging population globally puts strain on the medical profession. As older doctors retire, too few newer doctors take their place. The WHO estimates that there are about 7.1 million doctors that we're already short of. And this number is expected to rise up to 13 million in the next two decades. Yet, there is a paradigm in which being a doctor is such a traumatizing experience. People entering the profession, they're already burnt out. So how can we change that? One way is to bring joy back into medical studies. What I want to talk about with you now is both an individual as well as a community matter. It's a matter, it's a matter of attitude and mindset. It's about giving yourself permission to be a human being, rediscovering the joy and excitement that learning and life can bring. We need to find a reason to love to study medicine. Now, back when I was in medical school, um, there was a period of time where I had many, many exams. And I only studied to pass the exams. Uh, I was thinking of nothing else. I was not enjoying medicine at all. Um, but then one day I went to the library uh, and I came across this passage. And it changed the way I think. Um, and the passage said, don't just study for exams. Study for the day when you are the only thing between your patient and his death. Now, this really changed my way of thinking. It made me think, yeah, why am I just studying for exams? You know, I should study for something greater. I should study so that I can help someone in the future to bring joy back into their life, to give them a second chance. 
Now, being a doctor isn't just about knowledge and skills. Of course, that is important. Those are one of the pinnacles of medicine, knowledge and skills. But patients, they want to feel a connection. And for that, doctors, they need social skills. They need to be able to listen. They need to be able to show empathy. And they need to be able to show compassion. If all you do is study and stress over exams, then you may miss the fantastic opportunity to develop social skills, which is just as important in the real world. I'm not saying don't study. Studying is very important. But knowledge is not everything. If you want to be a good doctor, you need to develop into a complete, all-rounded person. This means having some friends, going out sometimes, uh, playing some sports, having a hobby. And don't feel guilty every time you lift your eyes off the textbook. For example, when I was in medical school, I would wake up 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. I go to my classes, I go to my lectures, I go to my practical lessons. And after school, I would come back home, I'd study for a few hours. But then the rule was, after 6 p.m., that's my time. So after 6 p.m., what I used to do was, for example, I used to go out with my friends. We used to go out for dinners about restaurants that we were, we were curious of. Uh, we used to go to uh, play pool or snooker. Uh, sometimes I would, uh, for example, study something else that I'm interested in, perhaps uh, business. Uh, I love to play guitar, so uh, I used to jam a lot with my friends. And we also, we did go to bars and talk to some pretty girls from time to time. Now, good doctors, they're competent, they're happy, and they're all-rounded individuals. So we should invest in our happiness, which will in turn affect our future careers. I have some words that I would like to say on QP. Now, an advantage that we now have is technology. Over the last two decades, uh, technology has progressed immensely. We don't need to carry heavy books with us anymore. Everything is our, on our phones, our iPads, our laptops. And we're a few clicks away, we can stream lectures online. We don't even need to go to lectures if we don't want to. <laughs> I'm not saying don't go. Um, and we can carry a whole library on the internet. Apps like QP, who I'm here representing today, they help too. They have compiled everything you need to know um, to pass your medical school, uh, as well as board exams, such as the USMLE or the PLABS. They've compiled questions into fun um, exam style questions. All you gotta do is go online, log in, choose a topic, and practice away. It's like one of those Facebook quizzes, but instead of you know, determining are you Gryffindor or Slytherin, and you practice on microbiology or physiology. I chose to represent QB because they share the attitude that I've been speaking of. Attitude of fun, of bringing joy back into medical studies and learning. It's a very ambitious team. They don't just want to build an awesome app, but they also want to change the future of medical learning. Have a chat with the guys at the back, especially Damien. He's the CEO of the company. Incredibly friendly guy. He's more, he will be more than happy to give you all the information you need. They also have a stand, so check that out during the break time. And that's me. Thank you so much for listening to me today. And I'm very sorry that I couldn't make it to the conference. Have a great day. QP.com. Practice your medical knowledge.